is stupid. He's been suspended indefinitely for comments made on Tuesday in Calgary. Flames face the Stars minus Avery as they look for their fourth consecutive victory. In the world of professional sports, there will always be drama. Whether teammates are throwing fists at practice, rumors of adultery, or even worse, focusing on the color of a man's skin. As a result of all this chaos and drama, players in the past have literally been blacklisted from teams or even the NHL as a whole. Basically meaning they were banned without actually being banned, which of course has led to some of the craziest stories that the game has ever seen. Like perhaps Gordy Gallant. Because get this, and I'm not even joking, after coming in late past his midnight curfew, Gordy Gallant, who was a player known for having a short fuse, and evidently had one too many beers that night, would receive a phone call to his room. Or head coach Harry Neal phoned in to check that his curfew was being met, and after not being present in his room and he was knowing he was about to get in shit, Gordy Gallant would storm into his coach's hotel room, and I wish I was joking, would punch out his own coach. Yes, you heard that right, would punch out his own coach. Now luckily, Harry Neal would be fine, and even though Gordy Gallant was a fan favorite, a solid player, it wouldn't matter, as he would never see another game in the WHA or NHL. He would play four seasons in the minors and would retire. Quick pause here. Huge announcement for the RTH channel. I know many of you have been asking for it for the past three years and it is finally here. As I'm very happy to announce the RTH podcast channel. For those who've already supported us, I really appreciate it. I'll leave a link down below and again, any support would make my day. All right, that's all, back to the video. And talking about teammates hitting each other, this isn't even nearly as bad as Patrick Seeloff, a story that sparked this video that we recently covered briefly, but also one of the most bizarre stories I have ever heard. Because after finally being called up, after many years in the minors, Seeloff was the prototypical shutdown defenseman with next to no offensive capability, yet, this dude would score two goals in his only two NHL games. Which might make you think, how possibly could a player who has two goals in two games, on top of solid defensive play, never see the NHL again? Well, after a fiery training camp back in 2016, recall, this is practice. Seeloff, who was evidently just trying to make an impact, would lay the boom on Clark MacArthur who keep in mind was a respected veteran and was already battling career ending concussion symptoms. And as a result of this practice hit, I repeat once again, practice hit on your own teammate. MacArthur would be okay, but this hit led to more concussion symptoms, which sadly single-handedly ended his entire NHL career, as MacArthur would never suit up again after this incident. Not to mention that Bobby Ryan would instantly lay a beating on Seeloff, but it's okay. It's one incident. Psych! Because the very next training camp, Patrick Seeloff would attempt to make an open ice hit on Mark Stone. Of, of all people, Mark Stone stood him up, and Patrick Seeloff, my god, would swing his stick at Stone and, and ask him to fight. How does a man who worked his entire life to reach the NHL? ruin his entire future NHL career by ending the career of his own teammate and then by asking the best player on his team to fight and practice after attempting an open ice hit. It's honestly absurd. Seeloff would be instantly sent down on waivers, never seeing NHL ice again. He would then spend several years in the HL and is now playing in Germany. So more of the story, don't ever be that over aggressive toxic teammate. Yet, this story may not be as absurd as the Connor McDavid injury saga. Because after starting his now historic NHL career, McDavid was poised to win the Calder and take over the NHL as he is today. However, Connor McDavid's season would end in a dramatic fashion. Because after driving to the net, as McDavid does, Brandon Manning, after a heated game, would shove McDavid into the boards, which would result in McDavid breaking his clavicle, as well as missing the remainder of the season. And this is where the story gets bizarre, as Brandon Manning is a heavy hitting defenseman who proved valuable in a bottom pairing role, as he would play several seasons with the Flyers, eating some pretty big minutes, as he would play over 18 minutes per game in 2017. But after the season ending injury, McDavid would even go on record to say that there was intent to injure. And then, it would happen. 
Brandon Manning would be shockingly acquired by the Oilers for Drake Kajula, who keep in mind, was one of McDavid's best friends. Just a classic Peter Shirelli transaction. And after being acquired, he'd play a couple games for the Oilers, and then was basically buried in the minors. And just like Patrick Silov, is now playing in Germany. But this is just a super odd story of a hard-hitting defenseman who after injuring McDavid and being buried in the minors, was unable to find another team in the NHL. When it comes to the founding fathers, the ones who paved the way to make the game so great, there's arguably no one greater than Ted Lindsay and what he sacrificed to form what we know today as the Players Union. Because back in the day, specifically the 40s, the NHL was seeing a lot of success, with names such as Gordie Howe, Maurice Richard, and Ted Lindsay paving the way. And yes, Ted Lindsay of course has the trophy named after him, but back in the day, owners were getting rich. And well, the players, they were being paid so little that majority of the league outside, you know, the top superstars, needed summer jobs to make ends meet. And so over time, this would start to infuriate the players. Not to mention back in the day, the players had next to no rights and were basically just owned by their team. During one season, Doug Harvey of the Montreal Canadiens alongside of Ted Lindsay would decide to take a stand even though they knew there would be dire consequences as they would get all the players on board and they would form a players association which would lead to the creation of the NHLPA in 1967 which ensured the players were getting what they deserved whether it was a good pension, medical care, or a minimum salary that didn't require NHL players to need to have a second job to survive, as again, their campaign would spearhead the players association that we see today. But there were some horrible consequences. For one, Doug Harvey, who was on pace for his seventh Norris in eight years, would be instantly traded to the New York Rangers after spending his entire career as a Montreal Canadian. And as for Ted Lindsay, he would be instantly stripped of his captaincy and shadow banned from the Red Wings organization. And not only that, he'd be then shipped to Chicago, who at the time were the worst team in the league. Just absurd. As there were even reports that no other team would take them, as owners around the league were livid about the idea of having a player's union. Ted Lindsay was a legend, and he knew he was going to have to pay, and was willing to sacrifice his career and legacy to do so. Even though the NHL contained some of the most humble, down-to-earth athletes in the world, there is also a very dark side to the game. One that has been vastly improving, don't get me wrong, but a side that still needs to see progress. As we have seen horrific incidents in the past, such as Willie O'Ree, the first black person to play in the NHL. Because even though Willie was a great player, NHL teams were not even considering him because of the color of his skin. All of which, besides the Boston Bruins, where he'd played two games in 1958, followed up by a 43 game stint in 1961, where he would still put up 14 points with next to no playing time. Yet, that would be his final season playing in the NHL. Or perhaps a more recent case, as we would see Ted Nolan, as he would make an astonishing coaching debut with the Sioux Greyhounds of the OHL, where Nolan would come on the scene as a new coach and coach the Greyhounds to the finals three seasons in a row on top of claiming back-to-back -back championships. And all this success would ultimately land him a head coach position in the NHL. And in his second season with the Buffalo Sabres, my god, he would do it. Leading Buffalo to a 40, 30, and 12 record, surpassing all expectations, where he would even claim the Jack Adams Trophy for being the coach of the year. And I know what you may be thinking, Ted Nolan's track record up to this point was extremely impressive. Yet, after turmoil during the season, specifically an incident where Pat LaFontaine would take a hit to the head and was clearly concussed back in the day when, you know, concussion protocol was laughed at, Ted Nolan, who was worried for LaFontaine's health, would tell management that there was no way in hell he would be playing, which nearly caused him to be fired on the spot. He stuck to his guns and made sure LaFontaine was coming back in healthy condition. But again, this was during a time period where when players saw stars after a hit, had to keep playing or they'd be ridiculed as just being weak. And this move would cause a shitstorm in Buffalo media, as all of a sudden headlines were coming out that Ted Nolan was a drunk and didn't know what he was doing, which was clearly racially motivated as Nolan is a Canadian First Nation, among other disgusting rumors such as adultery. And so after the sitting of LaFontaine and all the racial prejudice, Ted Nolan would become the first coach in NHL history to win coach of the year 
was not hired the next season. And no, it doesn't even stop there. Ted Nolan would not be hired for the next decade. After proving to be an amazing up and coming coach, winning the Jack Adams, my man would be blacklisted from the NHL based on fake rumors in the color of his skin, which is honestly just disgusting. And also I will add, the Sabres did offer him a contract technically but it was a one-year contract with the lowest possible salary, which was basically them spitting in the face of Nolan as they knew he would reject it. And so after being nine years without coaching, Ted Nolan would be offered a job in the QMJHL and in his first season back, even after being barraged with racist chants all season long. He would coach that team to win another championship, proving his immensely successful coaching style once again. And after seeing more success, Nolan would land a job coaching for the Islanders, where he would have a great first season behind the bench. Yet, the next season he would be fired by who else but Gar Snow for apparent disagreements. He would then be shunned by the NHL for another stretch, and what do you know? He would be hired once again by the Buffalo Sabres, the place it all started. Yet, Ted Nolan would go on a record for saying the Sabres basically wanted him to lose games, he would stay for another two seasons, couldn't take it, and would retire from the game. 